I'm Reverend Phil, and I'm your host, Words of the Prophets. Where are our prophets now? Where are those messengers God chooses to communicate divine revelation through? In the past, the Creator sent prophets like Abraham, Siddhartha, Jesus, Muhammad, and many more. Maybe our higher power has switched tactics since we reinterpret God's words as soon as the Creator's prophets leave us. Could it be that Spirit talks to each one of us individually and we haven't learned to listen? On Words of the Prophets, our modern prophets show us how to find the internal prophet that is the I Am, and we discuss the application of spiritual principles in all aspects of our lives. I'm Reverend Phil, and I'm your host for Words of the Prophets. Sitting on the far right is my good friend and co-host, John Monroe Castle. Hi, John. Hello, Phil, once again. Welcome back, my friend. It's good to see you. Good to see you, too. And in between us is another good friend. Our guest is Reverend Dr. Bernardo Montserrat, who is the senior minister at the Santa Fe Center for Spiritual Living. Hi, Phil. Welcome. Thank Welcome. you. Yeah. We've got a good story to tell about him. Maybe we'll tell it later. About the time you... you no, I'm not going to get into it now. Um, <laughs> anyway, so today's prophetic topic is... Become aware of that which already is, and we'll get to explain that as we go along. But this phrase comes from a book that was written by Ernest Holmes, who is the founder of, it was basically, what do you say, Church of Religious Science? Would that be a good? Yes, that's a good description. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's found on page 26, but it actually starts on page 25, and it reads as follows. Uh, and the book is How to Use the Science of the Mind, by the way, excuse me. The paragraph reads, The power is not so much in the statements we use as in the consciousness they induce. They, are, they help us to become aware of that which already is. So before we get into that, how about a little quick backstory? How did you become a minister in the Church of Religious Science? Well, Phil, the story begins, um, gosh, 35 years ago when I... Uh, returned to the United States from three years as, in a, as a Peace Corps volunteer and um, was beginning to do some of my own uh, inner quest, uh, inner search for um, a new philosophy of life, uh, something that would give me some clear direction as to what I wanted to do with my life. I was uh, at that time in my early 20s and uh, was introduced to this philosophy and, and this particular church in, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, and that was the Church of Religious Science. And I began to listen to the teachings of Dr. Ernest Holmes. And uh, they were extremely helpful in assisting me envision for myself a lifestyle uh, that would include not only a, uh, a practicality of what I wanted to do at the time, which was to develop a profession, to, to gain a long-lasting relationship, um, a partnership, and, uh, and as, as well as uh, a, deep, a deepening of my spiritual sense of self. And so those two things, the practicality, uh, of spirituality and life and, and a deeping, deepening of, of a mystical sense of self. And this philosophy uh, provided both for me uh, uh, at the time and ever since. And so it's been a continuous study that eventually led to my interest in the ministry, which I um, entered uh, 25 years ago. It took me five years to complete my studies in ministry, and then I've been the senior minister here in Santa Fe for the last uh, 20 years. Was there a big difference between what you grew up in and going to this, or is this an extension of what you grew up in? Well, I grew up in a, in a sacramental religious religion, meaning that there was a lot of symbolism uh, um, expressed um, in, in the way in which religious uh, life and expression um, was done through the sacraments. Uh, so in, in that way is very different. We, the religious science uh, does not have ritual, uh, at least not that kind of formal ritual. It doesn't have much dogma. 
in, it certainly doesn't have much moral dogma, meaning that these are tenets that, the, that we expect the individuals to live by. Um, so there are some great differences uh, in that respect. There are some similarities, obviously, in that we do believe that there is one God and one God of all people, and, and that each and every one of us can have a direct revelation of what it is that God is to us and what it is that that uh, super uh, supra being uh, can be in our lives and what it is that it's being asked of us. Does the church have a text, so to speak, a book that it works off of? Or? We have a basic text, but it's not a text as it would be considered in many other religious um, disciplines. Uh, we don't consider the text to be scripture, for instance. Okay. So we don't, we don't hold what is in the book to be the only book to be read. Um, it is a book of philosophy uh, and is to be read and interpreted according to the readiness of the individual. Uh, the the quote with which you started the the program is is apropos in that it was Dr. Holmes' uh, firm belief that if we can but view life uh, rightly the way that is laid out for us, if we can learn to see it rightly, that we will respond to it in a creative and loving manner, and. So the entire um, focus of the philosophy, if you, if you will, is in teaching individuals how to view, right, view life rightly and how to um, follow that up with uh, the intentions of their creativity and their willingness to open their hearts for a, a greater expression, uh, uh, expression of love. What would a typical service look like? Somebody shows up at the Sunday, right? Mm -hmm. So they, they, they watch the show and they say, I want to check this out. What could they expect when they walk in the door, so to speak? Our, uh, all services among religious science have some things that are similar and some, and, and, and some uh, things that are different, as you would expect in, in, uh, in most religions. The, the, the backbone of our Sunday service is a lesson. And, and, we, and, we, and it's called a lesson and because our tradition comes from Christian science. Um, religious science is, um, we are a distant, uh, not distant, a close relative, uh, nieces and nephews, if you would, of Christian science. And, and if you were to go to a Christian science service, you would see that they teach a lesson. And they call it a lesson in truth. So the backbone of our services of religious science is a lesson that the minister is responsible for taking a particular topic and interpreting that topic according to the teachings of Ernest Holmes. Um, so that's the main thrust. Uh, all, there is an introduction to that which includes music, that in, uh, includes prayer, includes chanting, uh, it includes um, communal prayer. Um, it includes a method of prayer that we teach, which is called a spiritual mind treatment. Again, comes from the Christian science background. And a spiritual mind treatment is the manner in which we pray not so much to a God, but as spirit, as expressions of spirit. Let's explore this a little bit, because I, we'll get into the spiritual mind treatment as well, but let's talk about Dr. Holmes for a second, let's talk about his connection, his revelation, so mm -hmm. to speak, that mm -hmm. created this offshoot of religious science. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Holmes was a, not unlike many individuals that started movements such as religious science, was an interesting fellow. He did not have a full formal education. I think he got as far as the seventh grade. He, he by the way, lived, uh, I think he was born in the um, late 1800s, lived until 1960. 
So he lived at a time in this country where there was a tremendous amount of um, growth and expansion. It was a, uh, a time when the Industrial Revolution was taking place and this country was busting at the seams with, with communications with railroads and, and uh, medical science was just starting to, to flourish. And, and there was a great uh, ex uh, interchange of, of philosophy. Uh, the transcendentalists were very popular at the time. Ralph Waldo Emerson and Margaret Fuller and, um, and the likes uh, back east uh, around the area of Boston. Um, and that's the area where, where Ernest was born and came from. He came out of that tradition. Uh, Mary Baker Eddy um, is, is the founder of Christian Science uh, there in, in Boston um, also as well. He grew up uh, in the midst of this intense inquiry into a new way of thinking. This was new America and breaking loose from uh, the traditional tenets of, of uh, Christianity. And they began a movement that has become to be known as New Thought. Uh, and this is a, a way of thinking that uh, took transcendentalism and into not only a philosophical uh, posture, but into a um, spiritual, it gave it a spiritual component. And so Ernest began to make inquiries, began to read. He read, he read copiously into philosophy, uh, religion, um, science, and he put together this uh, body of work, uh, if you would, that he called the science of mind. With that body of work, he began to do some um, teachings at the beginning in a very humble manner. He taught at libraries and people's homes. Wherever he was invited, he would give lectures on this new thinking um, that was gaining some popularity. Um, Christian science, unity, uh, religious science, all of that in the late 1800s, early 1900s, was just beginning to gain uh, a great deal of enthusiasm and thrust. Initially, he was not interested in starting a religion. The science of mind was a philosophy and was taught as an adjunct to other religions. So you could be a Catholic, a Methodist, a, a, a whatever form of Protestantism. And, and you could go on, on uh, Saturday night or, uh, or early Sunday morning, and then you could go listen to Dr. Holmes' lecture, and he would lecture um, later on in the large uh, auditoriums uh, around the Los Angeles area and all over the United States. And his lectures were not so much about a particular religion, though... I, I have to say that if you read his original text, there is a great deal of Christianity, of the teachings of Jesus that are involved in that, that are invested in that particular text. So his background was mainly Christian, and that's how he substantiated his teachings by, by what Jesus said. Which is what Christian science does. So exactly. How, how could he not really, to some extent? Exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, that's the same thing that Mary Baker Eddy did. Where she looked at the scriptures and, mm -hmm. and reintroduced them with the idea of how to use what Jesus said uh, under the auspices of a healing uh, ministry. And, and so Ernest uh, took that and just ran with it. And that's how um, religious science got to be, take the popularity that it did uh, in those days. At the beginning, as I said, there was not a particular interest in developing a religion. At the beginning, there were only healing practitioners involved in his ministry. And he would train practitioners who would go out and practice emotional and physical healing. Uh, at one time, he even opened a hospital in, in the outskirts of uh, Los Angeles where he did physical healing. He would take in patients 
and uh, housed them there until they felt better through the use of uh, the mind and the treatments that we're giving through um, uh, mental powers. Yeah. All of that evolved in time. He moved just beyond the teachings of, of Jesus uh, and began to read more on Eastern philosophy and meditation and began to um, build that into a whole body of belief and work and practice that eventually got to be known as religious, uh, religious science. In that process, um, ministers of other denominations were attracted. And the movement then developed from being just an, an institute that was an adjunct to other religions. It, it took an identity of its own as, as its own religion. And that's when it got to be called religious science. There are two statements I think are kind of the same, and I just want to touch on them a bit. Um, one of them was uh, re that religious science reconciles spirituality with science, and the other one was Einstein's energy and mass are equal. And I think that they're both saying the same thing, in, you know, that this was an attempt to bring both together, so to speak. From the, from the very beginning, as I've mentioned, there, the, there was a, a keen interest in using uh, mental spiritual powers as a healing uh, agent in the lives of individuals. This at times was seen as com competition with uh, medical science as was the case with Christian science, where there's been in many, many cases where uh, mm -hmm. the, the beliefs and practices of Christian science have come in direct opposition with um, medical science. Ernest Holmes took another track, and that track was that his philosophy, his practice of spirituality could, could and would complement the work of medical science and that any discovery that science would make, i.e. quantum physics and, and the work that Einstein and, and, and uh, his cohorts were doing in, in, the, uh, in the early 1900s, would support whatever spiritual principles um, could be uh, and have been practiced throughout ages. And as far as we know, as far as we know, there is nothing that individuals, I mean, scientists like Niels Bohr, for instance, have discovered that, that it's not the case. Um, for instance, and I'm going to simplify things here a little bit for the sake of our audience, but, you know, what, what quantum physics have learned is that the very essentials of, of, of matter is, is not a, something that, that is uh, designed in concrete, but, but it's a particle and a wave, and it depends at, at what point does it get observed, whether it's a, it's a thing or, or, a, or a thing in process. The way that we view healing, for instance, has some, very, some similarities in that we see reality always not only as a thing, but also as a process. And those two things coexist hand in hand. Uh, and it's up to the eyes of the beholder to either see them as a, an end result or something that is still in process. So if we take energy and mass and say they are equal, what we're basically saying is energy is the spirit, mass is the body, they're equal, and That's one right. can influence the other. That's correct. Which direction do we want to go in? Exactly. That's exactly correct. And it just depends on which side of the equation you want to look at that will substantiate the argument or the perception that you're having. So therefore, it's probably easier to use spirituality to heal mental, emotional than it is to heal physical because the physical is more denser and has to have a stronger belief. That, I mean, that is a good argument. I mean, that, and, 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 there, and there's a lot of folks who would say, yes, you're right. I, for one, would, would tend to agree with you. There are those who are purest in nature that would say there is no difference between, between the spirituality and the matter. So if you heal the spirituality that, that helps to heal the emotions, the physical healing is bound to follow. It, it cannot but follow that. 
And um, <clears throat> if it isn't seen that way immediately, it's seen that way in potentiality. That's correct. And so it may not seem that energy and mass um, uh, are always going to work out in a certain result, but the potential is there. The potential for the um, electron to become something else for the, uh, the wave, the particle to be a wave mm -hmm. uh, or to be a particle, uh, depending on what, the particle's choice. We don't even know exactly the nature of the observation, mm -hmm. the relationship between the observer and the observed phenomenon. And the fact that it's not concrete means that it is loaded with potentiality. And so it can go anywhere. It can go in any form, in any direction, because we are not controlling that direction. So if somebody says, I need emotional healing, and physical re healing results, we say, of course it does. Mm -hmm. And if somebody says, I need em emotional healing, and physical healing does not follow, then we might say, stay tuned. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not over yet. Right. Because it is a potentiality, it is in process, mm -hmm. as you put it. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason I made that statement, and I don't want to get too far off the path here, but I do a lot of energy work with people, and I do energy healing. Mm -hmm. You know, and my brand, so to speak, is called Reiki, and I'm not going to get into that too deeply, but I find that when I'm working with clients who have come in depressed or emotional, it's a whole lot easier to... to work on a healing than I have with people who are coming in with, with deep physical problems. Mm -hmm. and it, the healing sometimes takes longer, you know, more sessions on a physical basis than it does on an emotional basis. Mm -hmm. And that was the basis of that, that statement. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a valid statement, by the way. It's a very valid statement. So let's go to spiritual mind treatment. What mm -hmm. exactly is that? A spiritual mind treatment is the form of prayer that um, Dr. Holmes designed. It is called scientific prayer or positive prayer. It has, uh, in its latest version, it has five steps, though it can take as many steps as needed, uh, as many or as few as needed. It begins with a premise, and the premise is not unique to religious science. The premise is that God is all there is, and one either resonates with that or not. You know, that's, that premise, we, we, we don't say God is all there is because it says it in the book. When we say God is all there is, you either say, yes, that, that resonates true for me, or I can't buy into it. But the rest of the prayer is based on that, on that premise, that there is this universal, you, you know, whatever you want to call it, spirit, uh, um, power, energy, uh, um, presence, uh, that is in everywhere, in everything, in all situations, in all circumstances, in all individuals. It is everywhere. So that's the premise. The subsequent mm, understanding is that if God is everywhere, then it has to be in me and it has to be in you. That nobody is excluded. That no situation is excluded. That connection is essential if the prayer is going to take effect. Because at some point, the individual has to say, I have the power. The power is in me. The power is not somewhere out there. Though it may be somewhere out there, but it's also in me. It is, who I, it is who I am, it is what I have. And once that, that sense of identity established, then the individual can see rightly. And that's the initial quote that you read, the very first quote. Mm -hmm. That's where he's coming from. That, if, we, that if, if that identity of the power of the universe with the power of the individual can be seen as one and the same, and, and function as one and the same, then the way that we proceed with our lives can be as creative and as loving and as unifying as we would, could ever wish or want. But it's all based on that initial premise and the subsequent assumption 
that if God is all there is, then I'm it. I have to be it. And so this situation to be the same. Whatever discord may be happening in my life or whatever wish may be happening in my life, it's all part of that presence that in some way is evolving itself in me, through me. So being one with it, I have the ability to influence it and change it. Maybe the other it, way around? I'm sorry. The other way around? or It meaning the, the, Whatever the deity? Oh, the situation. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I or the other way around, meaning that it has the power to influence, the, to influence me. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because part of this process, and, and this is the beauty of the paradox, which is, though God is ever-present in all situations and all circumstances, and thus making it perfect in some ways, it's also ever-constant and ever-changing in its representation here on earth mm -hmm. as you and me. So we are always, though each one of us is perfect, whole, and complete, we're also evolving according to the way that that situation is um, affecting the way that I see myself and in the way that I see reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There, I believe it was Emanuel Swedenborg who once said or implied that the ability to do this is directly related to the individual's ability to visualize. Mm -hmm. You think, I mean, does that ring true with this, I mean, with what the teachings of Dr. Holmes are? Well, Dr. Holmes was very influenced by the work uh, on the writings of uh, Swedenberg. And visualization is but another form of mental um, envisioning, um, mental creativity. So visualization is uh, the capacity to put f thoughts, um, wishes, or desires into a m more concrete fashion, if you would meaning that we've gone beyond just explaining it in words in our minds, but we've been able, we're now able to see what it is that we want or wish our reality to be. From that premise, then visualization certainly has a much more empowering uh, creative function for the individual. However, if somebody is compromised in his or her mentation, Mm -hmm. or um, ability to visualize, mm -hmm. that does not exclude them from, oh, of course not. from God. That's right. From truth. Mm -hmm. Right? That's correct. And, That's correct. and so I'm, I'm interested in, in where, Dr. Holmes, where you put human limitation, whether it's the limitation we impose upon ourselves of perspective and perception, whether it's the limitation of um, genetics, uh, of uh, what we call accidents mm -hmm. um, that, that somehow make it difficult for us to formulate vision, right. formulate ideas. Right. How, how then is, is such a person in relationship mm -hmm. with, with the one power? Right. With the one power. Exactly. Um, that's a very astute question. Um, we, in saying that God is all there is, we automatically eliminate evil. In other words, no dualism there. There's no dualism. <clears throat> so it's either all God or is not God at all. Mm -hmm. Automatically, then, that includes everyone and everything. But just like I was mentioned bef mentioning before, that there is a paradox that exists in life, mm -hmm. which is that. At, at the spiritual level, it is, it is all God, it is all spirit, it is all whole, complete, and perfect. And the way that it gets demonstrated, it is in constant flux, it is in constant evolution. It is that understanding, if you would, what makes, um, in, in our tradition, from the way that we see it, it is in the capacity to stand in that paradox that I am still in development but I, yet I am in, in, in perfection within the spirit, that spirit lives within me in perfection. It is my capacity to hold that paradox that allows for me to 
grow in consciousness, what we call in our tradition, to, to, to expand in my consciousness. Mm -hmm. The greater, the more expanded the consciousness, the, the more empowered I am to exercise changes and choices in my life that will benefit not only me, but the world around me. The less my understanding of the paradox, mm -hmm. the more unwilling, if you would, I am to exercise the growth that is necessary. Mm -hmm. The way that I think about myself, the way that I, 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 am, I believe I'm capable of learning about who I am, about the way that the world is, the more that I am uh, capable of revealing um, the truth of all that is, as well as the way that I have individualized my own truth, my cultural beliefs, my family background, my personality patterns, all of those are ways in which I have individualized. My, if I'm not willing to look at those and expand them in order to uh, um, lessen the paradox, that's what's going to limit my consciousness and eventually what's going to limit my capacity for creativity and my capacity for love. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I got so many questions, I don't even know where to begin. Um, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> let, 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 let's, let, let's back up to the service again for a second. Okay. All we've been talking about is this part of the thrust of the service is to initially get people to, one, believe that there is no separation, strengthen that, that concept, and then how do I apply it? That is, that is the focus of the service. The Sunday service is the spiritual practice, not unlike, you know, going on retreat, uh, doing daily meditations, uh, uh, going on a nature walk, um, going fishing. I mean, whatever you regard as a spiritual practice, Sunday service is no different, which is how do we warm up our minds and our hearts so that we open ourselves to both the ultimate truth of spirit being everywhere is all there is and the facts that we have to face about ourselves and the world around us and how do we how do we mm, how do we bring those two together mm -hmm. how, how do we balance the compromise how do we exist in the compromise uh, not in the compromise the paradox, the paradox. Because, because there are times when we when we are in a paradox in our lives that it's not going to get resolved quickly. And we have to have the inner strength and the faith to know that if I hold the truth that God is all there is, and I, and I will evolve and grow with this situation, if I can stand in that, if I can be in that, I will evolve as a, as a luminous um, person in the light of others. And I will come to, to influence the light of others, as many have. Yeah. Many mystics, um, many political leaders have been able to do that. Yeah. They've been able to see a situation in their lives or in the lives of the, of the people that they lead and know that there is a higher truth. I remember when I was in seminary, when the, uh, the terms ambiguity and paradox were in, introduced into the pastoral studies, mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in trouble now. <laughs> I'm in trouble now. You know, what, what does a 22-year-old know about, right. yes. you know, yeah. uh, the ability to stand mm -hmm. in a paradox mm -hmm. or to exist in the horns of a dilemma, mm -hmm. to, you know, breathe ambiguity. Mm -hmm. and, I, and that makes me think one of the purposes of um, a religious group of people is that when we stand in, in paradoxes together, then we, we begin to um, bring in an element of relationship that is very much a part of, mm. of what the one mm. God is. Mm. Mm. And that's how it, you know, God expresses through relationship. Mm -hmm. And so if I were to come on a Sunday morning, mm -hmm. is it fair to say that I could expect teaching not only in my own, of my own process and connection, but also my processes and learnings about relationship with others there. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully so. Hopefully so. Um, it, Sunday morning is not the only thing we do. We teach classes during the week. And um, each 
all of the classes are designed exactly mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. They're designed um, both to raise the consciousness of the individual, but also to assist them in becoming part of the group that uh, will pursue and support one another uh, through their periods of ambiguity. Uh, the motto of our center is uh, remember God, remind each other, oh. which like expresses that. both of those because in just remembering God often is just sufficient to, to, uh, to address the paradox that that is not just the facts that are facing me, that are accosting me, uh, that are uh, suppressing me, but it, I know that there is something bigger than I am. And often just mm -hmm. remembering that is, but that is not enough. The other piece of it is that we have to remind, we are in relationship, we are our brother's keeper. Mm -hmm. right? And when somebody is in distress, we owe them at least that much mm -hmm. to say, hey, Mm -hmm. it, this fax is not all that you are. Okay. You are much more than you, when, than you think you are. And we would hope that somebody could step into our particular uh, difficulty or challenge yeah. Yeah. with that same intent. And do it for us. And do it for us. Mm -hmm. Is Terrific. there an advantage or is there a belief that a group healing is stronger than an individual healing? Well, that is an interesting question. I'm not sure that I am uh, qualified to answer. I can, I can certainly give it, you know, the old gospel according to Bernardo uh, <laughs> answer. Anyway, uh, I don't think I have that. <laughs> is that still in process? <laughs> you know, there are those who will say that masses don't move by themselves that it requires leadership, enlightened leadership to move the masses. In other words, hmm. that the masses will tend to settle into the lowest common denominator and hang in there and move only when they absolutely have to. You know, only when there's a world war, <laughs> you know, do they move. You know, on, unless there is a higher common denominator, and that usually requires enlightened leadership, do the masses not follow. That the masses do not come together and begin to. This, this is a gospel of Gordon Bernardo now, and they, you don't have to take it as the gospel of truth. <laughs> this is just the way that I see it. Um, and so, to enlighten one individual is very much worthwhile. Mm -hmm. And there are those who say we're only going to get there one individual at a time. I don't know if I agree with that totally. I think that it is. It, it, we may the, get there, you know, groups at a time, and I think it's happening all the time, individually and collectively. Um, but it's, I don't think it's one or the other. Okay. I'm thinking about that, uh, the, the relationship of individual and group, um, not only in terms of healing, but in, in terms of uh, general awareness and consciousness. And it's not, uh, the, uh, the first uh, quote was, um, uh, can you can you read that first quote again about how it's it's Just not necessarily what is being said? Just a topic, become aware of that which already is, or a whole sentence. And, and then that first sentence. Okay, and the power is not so much in the statements we use as in the consciousness they induce. They help us to become aware of that which is already is. Okay, mm -hmm. and um, sometimes it is the spoken word which begins to ignite that consciousness. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's presence. Sometimes it's more and and, and both and all. And I'm thinking of Carl Jung, uh, the Swiss psychologist, who had a very well-developed sense of the personal, personal, personal unconscious mm -hmm. and the collective unconscious. Mm -hmm. And they are always interactive. Mm -hmm. There's always this lower group, which um, you may access through the personal unconscious. Or, but you need somebody or, or somebodies to spark it. Otherwise, we settle into a gravitational complacency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm intrigued by the gospel of Bernardo. <laughs> well, let's, let's take that a step further for a second. And it, and it I, sounds I, a little bit like the, the gospel of John 2. <laughs> <laughs> John 2. That's good. And there is a gospel of Philip. And, and there's um, a gospel of, well, yeah, that's true. There is. Um, question then, totally on this subject, but not what you talked about. Then are we not, would every prophet doomed to eventually fail because without that prophet sparking us, 
we get back to our own stuff. Isn't that been the history of prophets in this world? Well, it seems like whenever there's a certain level of complacency, there a prophetic, a prophetic voice comes into consciousness. Well, but if you listen to what John said and to the discoveries that, that Dr. Jung made, if you, if you play that out, every prophet will make a contribution to the collective unconscious, meaning that future generations will, will get a head start mm -hmm. on the previous generation, mm -hmm. simply because the collective unconscious has been moved, even if it's, you know, even if it's a tiny little grain of sand, it was moved by either, you know, an individual or a group uh, that, that, mm, that raised the consciousness, if you would. You know, yep. that made, that made a, 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 a greater contribution to the awareness of the whole. The and faith we'll, of a mustard seed. Yeah. Without move being, a mountain. Yeah. we're trying not to be argumentative. No, stay with it. Um, I suggest that the mere fact that 18, 1900 years after Christ is that Dr. Holmes had to reinvent what was already there suggests that we don't follow the prophet and it gets lost somewhere. My take on what I've read is that he didn't reinvent it, but rather worked with it again. Okay, mm -hmm. let me, and, I, I'll stand with that and correction, but I mean. You know, and was building on, on all that, you, you were talking mm -hmm. about the cultural influences of the early 1900s, mm -hmm. late 1800s. Mm -hmm. We had spiritualism in America, we had the transcendental movement, mm -hmm. everything, and it was all, and, and I, it sounds like from what I've read and what I've heard you say, that he was taking what was already given not to create something anew, but to bring his particular self and awareness to that which already is, which took us in a seemingly new direction. Mm -hmm. Which shouldn't have been there? a new direction. I mean, let's even take it back to Mary Baker Eddy. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I don't want to get too sidetracked here, but I just, it, I mean, to me, it, it shows that all this teaching, I mean, she was like in the 1850s, the 1860s, so you've got 1800 and some odd years of Jesus performing miracles and then basically nobody replicating that, doing anything with it until she comes along and says, this is how it's got to work. And, you well, know, there were many people, yeah, hmm. many people doing something with it. But not many, to the extent many, many that they, they put it together and made a practice out of it as extensive as what she did. Oh, I think many did. Okay. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Especially if you if you went ten thousand feet up and took a look at how it, you know the world and all of the consciousness raising things that were popping and sparking here and there, and they were there. Yeah. See, Phil, the other thing is that it, it's important to look at this the history of Christianity, if you would, within context, because um, the Christian world has had great difficulty allowing anyone to in any way duplicate the kind of work that Jesus did. And, you know, they were burned at the stake and called yeah. heretics and so on and so forth. Now, you go and study the Eastern and, uh, philosophy and religion, and those guys have been performing miracles well before Jesus ever came around, you know, and yeah. had experienced physical healings. And so, well, you know, there's nothing new about that. No, I'm not saying there's anything new, and I agree with you. I, I, well, I think what I'm saying is the structure. We were talking about the one individual as that spark and leader, mm -hmm. and I think the reason that the Easterns worked so well was that it was never one individual. It was always small groups of collective consciousness. The Himalayan study of science, yeah. spirituality was a science, was not centered around one individual, but was multiple camps studying the same stuff with slight variations. And I think that's why they were able to sustain themselves. But you come to the east, to the west, I mean, and you got Jesus, you got Boot, and you got Muhammad, and we've got people teaching stuff that I don't know. Just seems to once they were gone, the teachings were like reinterpreted and going back to the old ways instead of creating the new ways that I believe the prophets wanted. But that may be a whole other show. Let's let's bounce yeah, that's, from that. <laughs> <laughs> we have to delve into history, uh, and yeah. that would be quite a discussion as to what you know how indeed Western philosophy and religion has evolved over time, because it has evolved. There's no doubt in my mind that it has. Uh, 
And we have experienced terrific mystics that had to live in the periphery of, of what was accepted as Christianity because they didn't dare jump in the middle because they, they would have been up, you know, the, at the end of a fiery stick. Yeah. And they didn't want to go there. And I don't blame them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and if, again, from 10,000 feet up, if there's a particular darkness over the earth, as in the Dark Ages mm -hmm. and all that mm -hmm. terror, at the same time, on this continent, there were Im amazing democracies of native tribe, you know, native peoples working together mm -hmm. in an enlightened way. You know, the you know, Iroquois, Iroquois Confederacy grew out of uh, that. So if it's dark in one place, it's light in another. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So let's, let's go back to religious science for a bit. That's what we're here for. Um, is there a cosmology to religious science? Is there a, like a purpose for life? Is there, you know, is, is there a heaven and hell? Is there, a, mm. you know, mm. karma and reincarnation? Is any of that stuff part mm. of this? Uh, yes and no. Mm. I like those clear answers. <laughs> I think we're back to the ambiguity and the paradox again. <laughs> Well, the, 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 uh, the yes and no is that we, we give the individual a great deal of freedom to do everything from give their God a definition. Hmm. Well, you make up your own God. You, you just bring it to the table and we'll talk about it. Whatever you think your God is, we'll talk about it because your God is as legitimate as my God as your God. Hmm. The, We'll just take it, we're just going to assume that it's all one God and each one of us has a different interpretation of it. So beginning with that, you know, the same thing goes about the, the death and dying process. You know, where do you want to go from here? It's the question that we ask. You have been a participant in creating your life to the degree that you have wanted to be a participant in creating your life. How do you want to create your death? How do you want to create your afterlife? You want to go to heaven? Have at it. You want to go to hell? Have at it too. <laughs> when you're over there and you get tired of being in hell and heaven, I imagine you, you will use the very creative essence mm. that you've had here over there to create yourself out of, out of wherever there is into whatever something else is. If someone wants to interpret that as reincarnation, it, it's just a matter of using a word versus another. The truth remains that if God is all there is and I am an expression of God, then I am as loving and creative here in this body as I want to be, as I choose to be, now and forevermore. Hmm. And forevermore. So wherever it is that who I really am, and, and we, don't have, we, have dog, we don't have dogma about that other than my belief, who I really believe I am will be carried on in some ways for which we have no definition other than what that individual chooses to define. Hmm. Okay, let me, one thing, let me just try, try. karma has a variety of different shapes and forms. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like, and in your case you made the distinction, karma is what carries over from a prior life and cause and effect is what we do in this life. So it sounds like there's more of a real investment into cause and effect. What we think, what we feel, we create. Yes. As opposed to you know, what happened in another life. I, I, would, I would agree with that, that, that our philosophy teaches the law of attraction and, and what, what we choose to bring in our lives. We, we eventually demonstrate, uh, as we talked about earlier in the, in the process of healing, that if we can heal the spirit, uh, the, the idea of spirit, that if we heal the emotions, that the body will follow. Uh, that yes, we put a great deal of emphasis on the, the law of cause and effect and using that as the evidence, the, but it's so evident in, in, in the way that we already are creating our lives. There are folks that put more or less emphasis on the way that gets played out after life. I kid my colleagues that one of the problems with religious science is that we don't have a good afterlife program. <laughs> <laughs> that if we had a better afterlife program, maybe we have a larger following. <laughs> because, you know, after all, after, you know, death is one of the greatest anxiety producing um, the themes that we all have to deal with. 
And if we would go around placating folks and saying, well, if you live according to this 10, 10 uh, commandments, then, you know, you're in like Flint. If we did that, you know, we might have more following. But by the basic nature of our philosophy, we don't do that. We just can't do that. We have to leave it up to the individual to wrestle with those angels, if you would, themselves. Have, have you been uh, tempted personally or in your tradition to uh, dogmatize uh, along the way? Oh, well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and and what, do you, what do you think is, is, is probably uh, the, the more successful way to accommodate such temptation? I mean, it's, it's very human for us to try and, sure. and you know, sure. stop the world and, and make it, you know, crystallize right. Right. the right. truth or something like that. You know, my, this is, again, the gospel according to Bernard. So. <laughs> my sense is that dogma comes from the fear hmm. of unenlightened leaders that their flock will go astray unless they put some kind of barrier around them, mm -hmm. that human nature is basically evil and cannot be trusted. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what got Matthew Fox in trouble with the Catholic Church, for instance, that, that he said, there is no original sin, there is only an original, original blessing. blessing. When, in the moment he turned that around, the whole cosmology of the, Catholic, of the Catholic religion comes tumbling down. It, the, all of it comes tumbling down because he basically said the inner nature of the individual is good, not evil. Um, when you begin relying on, on your general cosmology for that, mm -hmm. uh, in, in, amazing things begin to happen. So for me, you know, you asked me a very direct question. How do I? I have to be in a constant reminder that everybody, even the most indignant of criminals, has always been doing the best they can. Good. Always. You know, if, indeed, if indeed God is all there is and is in everybody, then everybody's doing the best they can. Like Yogi know, Bajan used to say, if you don't see God in all, you don't see God at all. Yeah. Um, we're running down on time. So we're getting to that place in time where John does oh. his summary. Wait a minute, we've only been on for 10 minutes. <laughs> I know, time flies <laughs> when you're having fun. <laughs> Ah, thank you. You're welcome. For being here. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, as I've been listening and feeling and, and experiencing our conversation and uh, appreciating it so much, thank you, I find that there are some key, some salient um, and energetic statements. God is all. And it's good, mm -hmm. really, really good. And if we were to base our lives on that, our ethical, moral, philosophical um, life would be rich and full. And one tradition for experiencing this richness and this fullness is in the science of mind or the church mm -hmm. of religious science get that right, mm -hmm. with Dr. Ernest Holmes. And what you have described in your um, philosophy is this goodness and this allness and this unity that we participate in experientially means that we are responsible for our own growth and development. And because it is a church, we are responsible together for each others. There is an ethic there that is very important. And I find that that connection between God is all and good with our job is to enter the ambivalence, the ambiguity, the paradox, as you put it, means to wrestle with life, knowing that it is good. That really is encouraging for any of us who are in any particular challenge or strife where we feel that it's, it's going nowhere, nowhere good, just remember, it is going somewhere good. And there are places in the community, in your community, where you can experience this, not only philosophically, but in the heart. And your congregation, the Church of Religious Science, is one of those places. And I thank you for sharing that with us. You're welcome, John.
And with that segue, why don't you tell people how to get a hold of you, where you are, what your, okay. when your services okay. are. I am, um, we are the Center for Spiritual Living, uh, also known as the Center for Religious Science. Uh, we are 505 Camino de los Marques. Uh, that's uh, right mm, just north of Cordova and uh, Don Diego. And our Sunday services are at 1015. And uh, we have a meditation uh, service at 9 o'clock, preceding uh, that every Sunday. So you're welcome to come either day or, uh, I mean, at either time or both times. And um, you can find us at, uh, in the, and the web. Uh, the web, um, our address is uh, uh, Religious Science Santa Fe. And, uh, How about a phone number? Our phone number is 983-5022. 983-5022. Okay. We'll come back in a second. I just want to make a couple of quick announcements. Um, we invite you as our audience to participate in the show. At the end, there'll be credits rolling where you'll have a means to contact either John or myself. If you have any questions for either one of us, send it to us. John takes the good stuff, I take the bad stuff. That's the deal we made. Um, but uh, you know, feel free to contact us and you know, we'll answer your questions. Let us know if you want to answer them on the air or off the air. Um, also, John and I do spiritual counseling. So if you like what you're hearing and you want to work on something, you can contact us. Last announcement is that every Monday night at the Vitamin Cottage, there is a spiritual study group that I am co-facilitating, and it's from 6 o'clock to 7.15. It is free. Donations are welcome. So if you want to work on your spirituality, come drop in. Um, next week, we're going to have Shubharaji. She's a Hindu mystic who will be talking about Hinduism and more precisely a specific part of the Bhagavad Gita. So tune in next week. Um, got a closing thought for us? This is a very, and a very exciting conversation. Obviously, we 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 struck the heart of the matter for me, and you both asked some very astute and challenging questions. So obviously, you both have been on the path for a long time, and given your your own personal philosophy is a lot of thought. And, uh, and it's always a joy to be in the presence of, of, uh, of individuals who are serious about um, be, bringing light into their lives mm -hmm. and, and taking that light out into the world. Uh, it's, it, it, it's encouraging and, and, and it, it's a nice way to be reminded that yes, there is something out there. Yes. Uh, that's working itself just perfectly. Terrific. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Bernardo, for being with us. So if you didn't catch all that, 983-5022, call them. They'll tell you everything you need to know over the phone. Wonderful man, wonderful belief structure. Go experience it. And until next week, we thank you all for tuning in. I hope you got something out of this. If you didn't, I don't know what's wrong with you. <laughs> 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 We're having too much fun here. Thank you all. Love and light to every one of you. Blessings. 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 I'm Reverend Phil, and I've been your host for Words of the Prophets. Thank you for tuning in. Please join me again next week, same time, same channel, for more Words of the Prophets.